great writing based author of Section, The Lines Interrupted, um, which was published by John Murray in 2009. Um, and this year it is one Mind Book of the Year Award. Um, John lectures in creative writing at the University of Westminster. Um, he is also a poet, um, and we've got some of his books on sale here today, um, including Bunch Poems, um, which is put out by Waterloo Press, which is based in Hove. Um, and uh, I'm very, we're really honoured to have him here tonight. He's going to be reading from his memoir. So please, can you put your hands together for a very special welcome, welcome to him, John. Yes, uh, my memoir is about uh, my early life. Uh, I was fostered aged 15 after my father died when I was 14. Sectioned aged 16 and I was variously then um, homeless, unemployed. And uh, as you'll see from this little extract from my memoir, um, also in prison. Um, this was sort of back in the 70s, 80s. You might remember it, some of you, uh, there was a recession unemployment, a royal wedding, we seem to have come a long way. <laughs> um, so this is from the chapter called Pettenville. The water falls in needle thin jets, hot and steamy, as I stand naked in the showers. There's a chemical smell, something they put in the water, something to delouse us. We come out and sit on the benches and dry ourselves quickly, then wrap the towels around our midriffs. Prison-issued clothing lies in folded piles on the benches and we change into the gear and lay our old clothes neatly beside us. Each of us has been given a royal blue cotton smock with matching trousers and blue and white striped cotton shirts. The sort of city gents wear, strangely formal with the smocks and the trousers. I'm wearing prison-issued underwear as well, best of the pants, a faint grey crown on the back of the vest. My old identity is gone. The last threads of who I am have been taken away from me. I am now a Roman prisoner of the Majesty's Prison, Pendle. Next is tea time and I shuffle to the front of the line. I'm in a big room, bare brickwork painted cream, bars on all the windows, tables in rows where groups of prisoners talk and eat and drink. Prison officers stand around the walls, their white shirts and black ties, black trousers, Shiny black boots and big bunches of keys hanging from the thick leather belts in marked contrast to our flimsy outfits. The prisoner standing behind the metal trolley gives me a blue plastic mug of tea and a matching plate with a couple of thin slices of toast and marge. I walk off of it all and sit at one of the tables. What are you doing, son? A tall prisoner aged about 40 with dark hair and a broken nose is standing over me. In line, as I say. In line, as he says. What was it? Where I asked you? Oh, I see. 80 pence worth from the cold. Harry calls out, here Harry, come out the witches at this bloke. Another prisoner comes over. He's tall as well, about the same age. Light ginger hair and freckles, dull brown eyes. Where is it, Jack? I can't believe it, Harry, says the first prisoner. They put this geezer in pen for 80 pence worth of bed liners. Yeah. It's costing the taxpayer 235 quid a week to keep him in here. <laughs> Where's the justice in that? Where's the bleeding sense? <laughs> now he looks disgusted. A bell goes and suddenly tea time is over. The other prisoners rise as one and got to leave their mugs and plates on the trolley. Jack and Harry stroll off. The bell rings and rings. Time for lock-up. My first night in the prison cell. I was a member of the Indian hockey team at the Munich Olympics. My cellmate is a Sikh, aged about 50. He lies on the bottom bunk, his big round belly, purple turban and luxuriant beard, in stark contrast to the cells of Victorian drabness. There's a table and chair by the wall opposite the bunks, with a big white plastic pitcher placed on the table. A small sink is set into the far corner of the cell, and there's a mirror fixed to the wall above it. I sit on the chair facing him, fascinated by the turban. It's supposed to go seven times around his head, and I wonder what it will do when we sit down for the night. Will he take it off in front of me? Is he forbidden to do so? And where will he put all the yarn to cloth? Munich, I say, where they kill the Israelis. That's why he says, terrible business, terrible. We fall silent. I run a cleaning company out of Heathrow, he says, I employ a lot of Irish people. 
Very good work is the Irish. Perhaps you will look me up when you get a chance. That will be nice, I say. Do you smoke, he says quickly. No, I say. He smiles, if I'm sure I'm warm. Well, everyone in here, my friend, is entitled to tobacco, he says. Part of what they call canteen. Perhaps when they come round to take your order, you might let me have your allowance. That's if you don't want it yourself. Okay, I say slowly. I miss my wife, he says, sign. And my children, is there anyone on the outside for you? Anyone you are missing? Not really, I say. Oh, he says, never mind, my friend. I'm sure they will not keep you here long. You seem like such a nice boy. Well, it will be like that soon. I think it's time to retire for the night. He stands and he reaches up to take off his turban. This is the moment I've been waiting for. But he lifts the turban off in one easy movement. His turban is actually some purple silk stuck onto a head-sized loop of cardboard. <laughs> it's not a proper turban at all. There are no yards of silk, no unraveling, no sense of ritual. He lays out his bunk and walks a few steps towards the sink. I feel cheated, but I say nothing. Who knows how long we'll be sharing this cell? It could be quite a while. Do you want to go to prison, Mr. O'Donoghue? I thought the magistrate would wear a red robe and a long wig. But he's dressed in a dark blue suit, pink shirt and striped tie, a plump peach of a man with a soft red face and dark hair, sat high up on his bench. I'm charged with theft. I should have attended the court after I received the summons for trying to take the white trousers. But I didn't. I was sure Christ was coming well before the date of the hearing. Do I want to go to prison? Why not? Isn't this what it means to be a follower of Jesus? Didn't he say that those who believe in him will be brought before judges, kings, high priests? Wasn't this what happened to him, to the apostles, the disciples, all the martyrs and saints? I do, Your Honour, I say. He bangs his gavel and barks out the sentence. Reminded for reports, three weeks, take him down. The door opens and I walk in. It's like the cell I shared last night. Bunks, table and chair, white plastic pitcher, small sink in the corner, mirror above, the drab cream walls. But I'm on a different bank. I've been moved, but no one will tell me why. My new cellmate is lying on the bottom bunk. He's not very tall, about five feet four, with close cropped dark hair. He stares at the bunk above him and says nothing. Hello, I say. He rises on my elbow, cold grey eyes taking me in. His face looks like it's been chipped out of flint, all angles and corners, and his hair is black, cropped short. Look, Bally says so. His accent is as Glasgow as a head bunk. I'm about as happy as you are to be here. But I'm not going to get all chummy just because they've stuck some chunter in my cell. I've been in here six years. You look like you've just arrived from planet fucking Zorb. You keep your bunking out of my way and you'll get on fine. I wonder what he's in for. Six years. It must be something bad. I climb onto the top bunk and stare at the ceiling. It's about six o'clock in the evening. I can feel waves of hatred coming from him like intense white light. I can barely breathe. I don't make a sound. We lie there in silence until it's lights out. In the darkness of the cell, I can still feel the hatred rising from him in a thin white beam. I have to keep awake. I have to watch the white beam. The door opens and the prison officer stands framed in the doorway. Inspection in five minutes, make your beds and get ready. I take the pot from under the bed and go out onto the landing. I drop my trousers and shit into it. Groans go up from the other prison and stood out on the landing. Dirty bastard! Send him to the Muppet Wing! Get him out of here! The prison officer comes back along the narrow landing and sees what I've done. He calls another prison officer over. Pull up your trousers, says the second prison officer. I do as I'm told. Right, he says. Let's get you down to the hospital wing. Take this. The prison officer passes a small plastic beaker of brown liquid through the barred window of the cell. I know what it is. It's like acting. I swallow it all down and hand the, hand the empty beaker back to him. He's wearing a thin white tunic with blue epaulets and the shoulders over his black trousers and has a kind of face that most of the prison officers I've met. I watch him walk back down the narrow corridor. There are cells either side, about 20 altogether, and each cell holds just one prisoner. He passes out of my eye line and I hear his footsteps as he goes back to the office and in silence. Gradually, the long actor gets to work. I was in the fort once. The prisoner in one of the cells along the corridor was talking to us all. He has a country accent, a soft Somerset burr. I can hear him as he speaks, but none of us can see him or each other. We're all locked up and won't be let out until the dinner trolley comes around at six. Goose Green, it went on all night and the day after. Those allergies were a lot harder than you'd think. It took a lot of bottles to sort them out, 
but we did it in the end. The corridor full sign. Then the chatter starts up again. Right, you two's me up with a snout on his dinner, I'm going to the minute or a fag in here. Alright, Steve, I'll see what I can do. It goes on all afternoon. Ronnie and Steve brag about the crimes they've committed, the sentences they've served, the prisons they've been in. Their voices are nasal, cottony thin, like sparrows chirping by St. Paul's. It's like hearing echoes from the past, from Newgate, Brightwell, the Marshalsea. I close my eyes and try to put faces to all voices. My mother is calling me. I can hear her, but for some reason I can't see her. It must be the snow. It's falling thick and steady, muffling her words. I call out to her. I tell her I'm here, that I'm coming. But as I struggle through the blizzard, the biting wind, the cold, her voice fades. I can just make out the same faint sound of her voice. John, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Her voice dies away, echoes in the snow, till finally there is only silence, emptiness and silence. The cell door opens. They're going out today. Come on, they're waiting for you. I follow the prison officer in the nurse's tunic to the end of the corridor, where he hands me over to another prison officer. He takes me through the bowels of the prison, among corridors, and through a series of gates. We arrive at the large room where about 50 prisoners are waiting. They're all in blue smocks and trousers, except for a few who are in their own clothes. They remind prisoners who have refused to wear prison gear. We all sit on benches around the wall, the kind you see in changing rooms. With a sudden air of festivity. We're getting out. My name is called and I go with the prison officer to a room where I'm asked to sign for my possessions. He hands me my clothes and tells me to go and change. He opens the door for me behind him and I get out of the prison smock and trousers and shirt into my own clothes. I come back into the office and hand him my prison blues. He points to a place down the corridor and I go off to join a line of prisoners who are waiting for the doors ahead of us to open. Suddenly they do. And daylight bursts into the dingy air of Pimpton. We surge forward and out to the waiting van. I smile with the rest of them. I'm a free man. And I'm still wearing prison underpants and vest. <laughs>